This is the Digital Music Trends coverage of Medium 2014, an interview with Ken Hertz, senior partner at the Hertz Liechtenstein and Young LLP. DMT's coverage is brought to you by CI, the leading provider of digital delivery services to the independent community on ci-info.com. It's great to have you here at Medium. Uh, how's it going today? It's great. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Awesome. Really nice to meet you. So. You know, uh, first of all, I want to talk to you about the evolution of digital music services. You know, the evolution of the of the services over the past ten years uh, seems uh, like a relatively straight arrow for consumers uh, when it comes to uh, the way that they've developed. But when it comes to the you know the, the backline of how the deals actually got done, you know, there was so much uh, involved in, in doing that. So, uh, and and there was also like a bit of a struggle between the, techno uh, the technology side of things and the music industry side of things. So. How have you seen the two uh, sort of reconcile over the last uh, two or three years? Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, do you think that there are still fractions between technology and music industry uh, right now? Okay, so um, let me answer the first part. Sure. Uh, I think there was a lot of legacy uh, contractual issues and legacy artist relations issues that needed to be resolved before the record industry could accommodate uh, third party digital initiatives. So, um, you know, first of all, the record industry was very confused by digital to begin with. Um, and the reason is because the record industry was really divided up into two businesses, three businesses, right? There was, you know, the creation of the music, there was the distribution of the music, and then there was the retailing of the, of the music, right? The problem with that was that you know retailing required a significant investment in brick and mortar retail stores right so the record industry was in the business of making the music financing the music marketing the music distributing the music right in the form of physical devices and then the distribution business would lay off a good deal of the financial risk on wholesalers right rack jobbers merchandisers you know, sub-distributors, that sort of thing, and retailers, retail chains, big outlets, that sort of thing. Online, distribution and retail are exactly the same thing, right? In, in a digital context, creation of the music, marketing of the music, distribution of the music is all connected to retailing of the music. So it was very difficult for the record industry to see third-party retailers or digital distributors as anything but competition. And so there was a lot of resistance to enabling or empowering digital retailers, digital streaming services, digital partners, because the record industry saw them either as a threat, competition, or potentially a gatekeeper to consumers, right? They saw digital as an opportunity to connect directly with consumers and they really didn't want to empower anyone to control that relationship. So there was a lot of resistance to all of that. And, and in addition, there were, as I said earlier, there were also all kinds of contractual limitations that made it very difficult for uh, the uh, traditional record industry to even accommodate the consumer demand for digital services and the capabilities of digital services. So you, so you had this real disconnect where digital services had or were trying to satisfy consumer needs, and the record industry couldn't give them the contractual rights that they wanted to, even if they wanted to, without going back to each individual artist, without going back to each publisher, without in some cases going back to each songwriter and getting new kinds of rights that they didn't have already. And that was both embarrassing, confusing, expensive, complicated, and difficult to overcome not only the financial hurdle, but also, and the logistical hurdle, but then also the philosophical hurdle of trying to understand whether or not by doing so, they would be creating potential partners or third parties that they couldn't control would be, you know, unfortunately uh, in, in, um, on some level uh, indentured to, right? So the record industry was terrified. You know, they, you heard the phrase a lot, we don't want to create another MTV. You know, because as weak as MTV may be today, for a long time, MTV was a huge marketing partner for the record industry and one that they couldn't afford to say no to. It's terrible. And now they got YouTube. And now they have YouTube. <laughs>
<laughs> so looking at, uh, you know, uh, of course, the technology can be a fantastic enabler when you're looking at uh, artists that want to capitalize on the audience that they have. So big data is one of the subjects that you are uh, quite interested in. So looking at big data companies uh, uh, like, for example, Next Big Sound or Music Metric uh, in the UK, you know, do you feel like artists are making the most of these platforms yet? And uh, is there still a lot of understanding to be gained uh, when it comes to actually being able to interpret the data that comes from the analytics uh, of these sites? Okay, so the first, let me, let me, let me dispel the first uh, issue, which is, do I think artists uh, can gain a lot from working with metrics? Of course. In other words, if you're trying to market your music to a fan of this artist, then obviously knowing who are the fans of that artist could be very valuable to you. With respect to uh, what we can learn from the data, you know, I do believe that there is a big success story out there waiting to arrive um, where the uh, purveyors of data and th those companies that actually collect, analyze, retain data um, will be able to empower some kind of discovery recommendation technology which will be extraordinarily valuable not just to marketers of music but to consumers of music but then ultimately to marketers of everything and consumers of everything right because i do believe that um, lifestyle choices music motion pictures television books consumables of all kind tell us a great deal about you know, what you've done tells us, and what you like tells us a great deal about what you will do and what you will like. And so, whoever figures out how to crack the code in the data area, I mean, we're overwhelmed with data now, but nobody really seems to know what to do with it. I mean, the reason that big advertisers are migrating so reluctantly to digital, right, comparatively speaking, when you think, of, when you look at the mind share versus the market share that, that uh, digital has in the advertising industry, most of that is because of how challenging it is to measure the ROI, to measure the results of the expenditure. The other problem is, is that you have this, this crazy reality, which is, you know, it used to be you would buy advertising and you would then pay for it based upon its reach, right? Well, no one's willing to pay an unlimited amount. And the problem with, the, with digital advertising is that it has, in theory, an unlimited reach. You know, you put an ad on YouTube and 10 people could see it, Billions of people could see it, or millions of people could see it billions of times. How do you pay for that? And how do you measure the investment? And how do you determine how much you should invest in it? It's almost like what they've done is they've bridged this gap between advertisers and content creators, where the advertisers are the content creators. In other words, it used to be the content creators would take the risk of finding the audience, and then the size of the audience would determine how much they could sell their advertising for. Now, the advertisers create the content and they are taking the risk of finding the audience and then they have to measure internally what their investment was worth. But you can't predict how big the advertising, how successful the advertising itself is going to be in terms of its reach, let alone how successful it's going to be once it creates a reach on its audience, right? So for advertisers, it's a very complicated situation. I think, you know, the, the solution, to get back to your question, the solution is, is data. Right? In other words, we are going to find ways of predicting who is interested in what information, who is interested in what kind of content, who is interested in what kind of marketing message. And as soon as we can figure out how to translate that to people who want to spend money, it, it, we're going to see a lot of, uh, a, a really, I think, an explosion in the economic size of connectivity. It's just, you know, I think the, the, the biggest thing is now with all of these different services and entrepreneurs, applications, businesses, traditional, non-traditional, competing for our time and our energy and our attention, uh, it, we haven't yet reached the oversaturation point, but I imagine that we will soon. And then there'll be some kind of a shakeout where, you know, uh, you, know you and I are just not going to have time to do everything, to read our email to read our Facebook posts, to read our Twitter messages, to read, you know, our various applications, to use our various applications. These are not time savers, they're time eaters. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know the point at which either someone figures out how to use data to save us time and make us more productive, or we use data to make choices 
amongst the various things that we want to do with our time. Yeah. And uh, you are one of the uh, shapers of the uh, Transform um, uh, initiative that uh, 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 it was subject of a, of, of a, of a panel here uh, at uh, Medium as well. So can you talk a little bit about uh, what it is and, and how, how it came to be? Okay, so Transform is an event that was created originally by Will I Am in Los Angeles to fund um, uh, his uh, college track center in East Los Angeles in Boyle Heights with Lorene Jobs, Steve Jobs' widow, who runs a, a fabulous organization called College Track, which takes at-risk kids and helps keep them in school helps them succeed in school, helps them get into college, helps them stay in college, and helps them change their lives. Um, Will raised millions of dollars through a concert and a conference that he held in Los Angeles, and then he held it two years in a row, and then this year held the concert again and didn't do the conference, but, um, but the concept of Transform is to take our inner cities, take our communities, and take our at-risk kids and help them using science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, and, uh, and the arts, so what Will refers to as STEAM, uh, to make positive change in people's lives. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's fabulous what he's done. Uh, he spoke yesterday, he gave a keynote, and then afterwards we had a conversation about how uh, the music industry in particular uh, can uh, affect transformative change in the lives of kids in the lives of communities, right? The idea of transform originally was transform yourself, transform your neighborhood, transform your community, transform your nation, transform your world. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I was talking actually to, to uh, Lincoln Park's manager, and they've done quite a lot of uh, uh, really great work as well, uh, uh, charity-wise, which, uh, which is definitely something that uh, we'd like to see more major artists do as well. And, uh, uh, and also, do in a, also do in a sincere and engaged way. I mean, a lot of artists are happy to lend their audience to awareness building for charities, but very few artists actually make sacrifices to see charities succeed. Um, and even fewer actually engage and make the kind of personal commitment to solving problems that they could. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think part of it is that there's sort of this uh, George Clooney effect, right? When you see, hear George Clooney speak uh, about a cause that he's involved with, he's often more well informed, more able to discuss the topic than even the executive director of the charity that he's supporting or the, the people that are actively involved or the politicians that are involved. I mean, he's a guy that actually, like Bono, he's a guy who actually learns the information, knows what he's talking about, goes out and really advocates and uses his awareness building to really make a difference and make a change and move the needle. Will is like that as well. But many artists feel that if they can't be that well-informed, it's uncomfortable to get in front of the microphone because they are often subject to ridicule for talking the talk but not walking the walk, as it were. Sure. Finally, let's talk about uh, the relationship between artists themselves and technology brands. Uh, uh, you know, Will, Will I Am, of course, is a, a big uh, uh, proponent of technology that he also, you know, helps uh, create uh, as an entrepreneur. And uh, uh, we've seen a bunch of uh, relationships between uh, artists and technology companies that have gone uh, well or not, and not so well, whether the fit, uh, you know, worked or not. So, how do you see that evolving? Do you see more artists uh, getting involved in the arena of either entrepreneurship or playing an active role uh, within a, a technology, a corporate uh, environment to help them shape their creative direction? Well, I think to the extent that artists understand and cater to popular culture, I think technology firms have a great deal to learn from artists. Um, I think the successful artists, particularly commercially successful artists, obviously can help technology firms develop commercially successful, popular culture devices. And technology and popular culture have you know, converged over the last several years. I think that really part of it is about storytelling, right? In other words, I think that all the technology in the world is irrelevant if it doesn't connect with consumers' expectations and sensibilities around their world. And I think what artists in particular are good at is telling stories that connect emotionally with fans and with audiences. And so I think that we're entering a time where what we've realized is that convergence is about storytellers figuring out what they sell and marketers figuring out what, how to tell their story. And so 
when it works, it works because these two parties get together and do what I'm describing. In other words, someone develops a product that connects emotionally with fans and in many, in oftentimes leverages artists' sensibilities to connect with those fans in the same way. The best example is Beats by Dr. Dre, right? I mean, Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre are arguably two of the most successful people in the history of the record industry. Will I Am was also involved in developing the concept for Beats. Beats has connected with audiences in a way that we've never seen a product before at such a rapid speed with so little advertising, right? And the reason is because Dre represents a very simple idea, which is really clean beats, really clean music, really pure sound. And at the same time, we went from not carrying our audio device with us to carrying an audio device and a phone to having our phone become our audio device. And so when that happened, suddenly everyone needed headphones. And so the headphone market, I think, has grown perhaps tenfold in the last five years. And over that same period of time, over that same period of time, Beats headphones connected with audiences as a lifestyle device. And so Dre, Jimmy Iovine, Will I Am, Black Eyed Peas, U2, all the artists, Gaga, Bieber, Diddy, that collaborated with Beats translated to a successful technology, right? Which is what Beats headphones are, right? It's a it's an innovative technology, but it's really, you know, a great pair of headphones that communicates a sensibility about music that only an artist can convey. And so, you know, that's probably the best example. I think the other good example is Will's partnership with Intel, right? It was a big success for both parties. You know, Will showed up. Will went and met with the developers of products. Will met with the CTO. Will went to the developers conference. Will went to the Capital Summit. Will showed up for Intel at all these events where technologists, entrepreneurs, investors wanted to talk about what popular culture knows and understands about new technologies and also what they didn't know. And so I think Will did a good job of communicating that both on Intel's behalf and on his own behalf. And as a result, I think the partnership was very successful. Yeah. And, and, and that's sort of a testament of uh, having a partnership that results from a genuine interest of the artist as well, rather than just a commercial uh, um, relationship. Right? Yeah, I think the equities have to align. I think, you know, we have, we've seen many examples over the years of artists partnering with brands, of artists partnering with companies, where it does make sense and where it doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, there's a whole slew of partnerships between artists and automotive companies, which make no sense at all. Right? No one thinks J-Lo drives a Fiat. No one thinks Celine Dion drives a Chrysler. No one thinks that Phil, Sa you know, Phil Collins drives a Toyota or, you know, uh, you know, or that um, uh, Randy Newman should be singing a Ford truck jingle. You know, these are not, these, the, the equities don't align. And when the equities don't align, those partnerships don't make any sense. Whereas, you know, I think that you could, you could argue that, you know, Jay-Z's partnership with Budweiser on the uh, Made in America Festival was a very organic, very smart, very, you know, nicely aligned partnership. I'm not sure that anyone imagined that Alicia Keys and Blackberry or Lady Gaga and Polaroid really was going to make much sense. The Polaroid partnership was exciting at first because it looked like Polaroid was trying to use Lady Gaga's really innovative sensibilities to expand into new kinds of product designs but the products that they hinted at ended up not being the products that they released. And so that partnership ended up not making sense. Well, uh, Kenny, it was a real pleasure talking to you and uh, uh, good luck with the rest of Meetup. It's going to be a lot of fun, I'm sure, and, and uh, tiring as, as always. Uh, but uh, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of Meetup in 2014 uh, on digitalmusictrans.com or youtube.com slash digitalmusictrans.